15-year NBA vet, currently the television color analyst for the New Orleans Pelicans, and reacting to Klay Thompson as a Dallas Maverick, along with the other Nico moves, Antonio Daniels on Sean and RJ via the DNM leasing hotline on 105.3 The Fed. Good morning, man. Thank you for waking up with us. How are you? For sure, fellas. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Your thoughts on Clay leaving the Warriors for the Mavericks? Well, you knew it was coming. You knew he was leaving. Um, and from a business perspective, uh, from a relational perspective, you somewhat understand it. You know, we watched the Golden State Warriors win four championships with Clay Thompson, Steph Curry, Draymond Green, and some really good vets and role players. They financially took care of Jordan Poole. They financially took care of Draymond Green. Yep. And when it was Klay Thompson's turn, they actually put him on the back burner. Yep. So you knew that this divorce was coming. Um, you just didn't know on the other end that he would end up in Dallas. And, and I tell you what, when you start talking about free agency, um, and we discussed this at length on my Sirius XM show yesterday, I don't care about the name. I don't care about the resume. I care about the skill set, right? I care about the fit because there are guys that aren't household names but can really elevate the, the trajectory of a team. Example, Nico Harrison goes out and he gets P.J. Washington at the, at the break, and he goes out and he gets Daniel Gafford at the break. Yeah. That was a huge move for the Dallas Mavericks, but those guys aren't household names. For me, I don't care about the name on the back of the jersey. I care about the fit. I felt like this for Klay Thompson was a perfect fit because of his skill set and who he'll, who he'll be asked to be with the, with the Dallas Mavericks as opposed to who everybody expected him to be with the Golden State Warriors. So, A.D., some people are questioning, like, the style of play with – ISO ball, right? Give it to Kyrie, give it to Luka, that's it. Versus mm -hmm. this motion offense in Golden State. Is Clay just going to have to sit here in a corner and wait uh, versus the way that he's used to playing? How do you see that working out X's and O's wise? Well, I mean, I, I feel like for me, I, I mean, maybe I'm the, I'm the optimist with this. Maybe I'm the, the complete optimist with this. But even if it, it, let's hypothetically say it does become ISO ball. Let's that, that just hypothetically say that's what it becomes. You have a guy on the floor that is a career 40% plus three-point shooter that, in my opinion, is probably the second-best shooter in the history of the sport. And even if it becomes iso ball, what that gives Kyrie Irving and Luka, which is the best gravity duo in today's NBA, in my opinion, it gives them space. That's what this league is about now. Mm. It's about pace and space. It's about shooting. It's about putting guys on the floor that can create space for your stars. Look at what the, the Boston Celtics did. They have – that's the only team in the league that their top eight guys are legitimate three-point shooters because there's something to giving guys space and opportunity. When you have Kyrie and when you do have Luka, you're going to give those guys space. No disrespect to Jared, Derek Jones Jr. No disrespect to him at all. But – when you have Derrick Jones Jr. or Josh Green, now you can leave a man in the half because now you don't really have to honor those guys. Yeah. But when you have someone with Klay Thompson's skill set and resume, you have to keep a guy on him at all times. Antonio Daniels joining us here on 105 Through the Fan. All right, so you mentioned the fit, but in terms of his age, his decline, you know, mm -hmm. how much does he have left uh, in the tank? Like His shooting did go down a little bit, but how much of that is – he wasn't getting his open looks that he might get right. here with guys like Luke that's, and Kai. And, and that's a great that's a great way of looking at it because that's how I think at it too. Like, Clay Thompson will be 60 years old playing in a lifetime league somewhere, <laughs> and he'll still be able to shoot the heck out of the basketball. Yeah. That will never change. The difference is he's asked to be Robin in Golden State, mm. right? You worry about Steph Curry, and then you worry about Clay Thompson. There's a totem pole on every team. There's a depth chart on every team. They're going to worry about Luka. They're going to worry about Kyrie. They're going to worry about Daniel Gaffer and Derek Lively rolling to the rim and taking that away. Then they're going to worry about Klay Thompson. I feel like, yes, he is declining, but it's a given. Like, that, that's, that's life. You know, that's father time. But the things that he brings to the table and what he does best as far as his skill is concerned, 
will benefit, and it's exactly what the Dallas Mavericks need as well. Like, I felt like Nico Harrison and and Mark Cuban and Jason Kidd, they hit a home run in free agency because it's not just Clay Thompson. Najee Marshall, who's been with the New Orleans Pelicans now since he entered this league, is a heck of a pickup for them as well. And I know a lot of people won't know his name, but I guarantee you Dallas Mavericks fans will love the toughness and versatility of Najee Marshall. All right, so tell us about him because, you know, it was basically like they uh, you know, they, they, they got him and they lose Derek Jones Jr. And what kind of a player is he? I know he's a good corner three guy, versatile defensive player on the perimeter. Who's his NBA comp? I, I mean, his NBA comp is him. You know, like I don't really – he he. it's not like he's a rookie. Yeah. You know, Najee's been in this league for a while. So he's sat, he's watched, he's learned through vision, and when the opportunity has presented itself, he has made the most of it. This past year in New Orleans, he only started one game. Two years prior to, he started – a numerous amount of games, 20-plus games, and almost averaged 15 points per game in those starts. Mm. So, like, again, this – this a lot of times things are based on, like, do I know this guy? Like, is this guy a household name? And just because a guy is not a household name doesn't mean that he cannot impact your, your organization. Najee Marshall is a heck of a dude, one. He was the toughest guy on the New Orleans Pelicans team last year since he's been here. He has been the enforcer – in New Orleans, which is wild to say because we're used to enforcers being Charles Oakley or Dale Davis or Antonio Davis. Najee Marshall, 6'5", 6'6", and is one of the toughest guys. I can guarantee you this. Nobody will be pushing Luca around. <laughs> I can 100% guarantee you that. Yeah. But fans will love Najee Marshall's toughness, and they will love his versatility. He can handle the ball, he can shoot the ball, and he can put the ball on the floor. I love that scouting report, Antonio. I'm going to say this, fellas. Like, being the color analyst for New Orleans Pelicans for the last five years, when I saw the Woj um, tweet about Najee Marshall going to Dallas, I was kind of upset. I was kind of (laughs) pissed. Because now I know know that the Pelicans are going to have to play against that same Najee Marshall. That same Najee Marshall I watch every day in practice go head-to-head with Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson. That guy. Do you have any thoughts or scouting report on Quentin Grimes, who they got from Detroit? You know, the thing about Quentin, I don't feel like, and you know, I'll say this about Najee as well. These guys aren't, aren't finished products. Now, I don't feel like Quentin Grimes or Najee Marshall have got the reps that they need for us to actually, the only reason I can give it to you on Najee is because since Najee's gotten this league, I've seen every practice. You know, I've watched our training camp. I've seen every shoot around and watched it and called every game. Quentin Grimes for me is a guy that is um, interesting in a great way, though, because I don't feel like we've seen the best that he has to offer because he hasn't been in winning situations. And the thing that I've learned about this league is sometimes it takes guys getting in the right environment, in a winning environment. Like, for example, the P.J. Washington that was in – Washington. Dallas was not the same P.J. Washington that was in Charlotte. The Daniel Gafford that was in um, Washington. Washington was not the I'm sorry, it's not the same one that was in Dallas. You know what I mean? When you get out of, and, and I don't mean it in this way, but unhealthy situations, and you get into a winning situation, things mm-hmm. change. Things change. So with Quentin Grimes, I feel like all he needed, which is what I feel like a lot of young players need, it's a good change of scenery. You know what I mean? Put me around, put me in a winning environment so my, my skill set can somewhat thrive. I don't, I, don't feel like, I don't feel like it's fair to place a judgment on Quentin Grimes because of the reps that he hasn't received yet. Antonio Daniels joins here, 105 through the fan. Did they do enough with these two moves, Clay and Najee, to stay ahead of Oklahoma City, who picks up Caruso and Hartenstein? I, I'll be honest. I, I'll be. I feel like the Alex Caruso pickup for OKC was better than the Isaiah Hardenstein. This is me, again, because it's not about money. It's about fit. And if you look at what OKC did last year, they were the closest to duplicating the style of play that Boston did. Four perimeter guys with one shooter. 
as far as that shooter being the center, Chet Holmgren, Christoph Porzingis. I don't know how Isaiah Hartenstein fits. I know they paid him, and I know being a small market, you have to overpay. Oklahoma City, like many other small markets, would never be a free agent hotbed. That'll never happen. But here's the thing. If you look at what they did a year ago with playing J-Dub at the four and Lou Dort and Josh Giddy and, and Shea Gilders Alexander along with Chet Holmgren, that style of play was very beneficial to the OKC Thunder. So I would ask you guys, where does Isaiah Hartenstein fit in there? I wait. <laughs> Well, everyone was saying that they needed a big, that they wish they would have had Derek okay. Lively instead of us getting him. Okay, so if you do have Derek Lively, like, you know how hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah. Because if you do have Derek Lively, where does he play? In Oklahoma City. Not in Dallas, yeah. but in Oklahoma City. Because a lot of times what people say is, well, that same guy that is in this particular situation, if you take him out of there and put him in another situation, you're going to get the same player. And you're not. Yeah. What made OKC who they are is the fact that they could play small and they were successful at doing it. That doesn't mean that they don't have weaknesses. Alice Caruso, to me, will be that guy now that comes off the bench. But I just don't see how it's beneficial to OKC to have Isaiah Hardenstein at your five and Chet Holmgren at your four. I feel like it was beneficial to play Chet Holmgren at the five because now Chet Holmgren's going to have to guard guys like Jason Tatum. You know, in today's NBA, is different because your four man is not Charles Barkley. Your four man is not Tim Duncan. You know, your four man right now is really a three man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now to ask Chet Holmgren to guard those guys, I just don't feel like. To answer your question, the short answer, um, I feel like Dallas is right there with everybody else. You know, I, I don't feel like Oklahoma City and Minnesota and Denver are all like head and shoulders above the Dallas Mavericks. That, I feel like Dallas made it to the NBA Finals last year, and I feel like they've improved. Antonio, uh, Nico is really making us look stupid. We were making Al Bundy shoe jokes and uh, <laughs> all the other all the other comedy you can throw his way, and now he's sitting here doing work. What did you know about Nico, um, and, and, and what else does the league think about him with the way things are playing out here for the Western Conference champs? I didn't, I didn't know a ton about Nico Harrison. You know, obviously I've, I've heard his name um, through the, you know, through the NBA circle, through the NBA pipeline. I didn't know much, much about him. But my thing is, as I try, as I get older, I, I try not to, I try to reserve my thoughts on someone's actions, not what I hear from somebody else. And what I've seen from, from Nico Harrison right now, and, and for me, it started with Kyrie Irving. Like, we can look at Daniel Gafford, and we can look at uh, P.J. Washington, um, and even the moves that were made now in free agency. But for me, a lot of this started with Kyrie Irving. And just the understanding and confidence that he showed in that young man when it seemed like the rest of the world was writing him off. Right? It takes someone special to see something in someone that other people refuse to see. Because I watched Kyrie Irving and Nico Harrison completely recreate the narrative surrounding Kyrie Irving. I couldn't be happier for that young man. I could not be happier for him. And when everybody was saying at the time when Nico Harrison brought Kyrie Irving in, oh, you know what, this isn't going to work. You know, him and Luka can't work together. Blah, 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 blah. And then it doesn't work because they bring Kyrie Irving in February and all you have is March and April. And you know what they did? They re-upped. They re up. And if, if you know anything about this league, contracts bring confidence. So when they re signed Kyrie Irving, for me, I feel like that was the first step in changing the direction of the Dallas Mavericks, in my opinion. Because I feel like him and Luca is a really good fit next to each other. So for me, it started with everything that transpired with Kyrie Irving, and then he's been hitting home runs ever since. Antonio, it, it, it's, it seems like, you know, when we talk to, we listen to the fans, you go on social media, uh, this is about Paul George going to the Sixers. It, it, a lot of the people don't think that Paul's like a winning player. Uh, he gets kind of mocked for the playoff P thing. But teams and players, it seems to like really, really value him high. What's your take on the move of getting Paul George up there and what it does for them in the playoffs? For me, I, I'll tell you, I, I am not a fan of the big three thing anymore yeah 
I mean, when has that worked? Outside of LeBron joining the Miami Heat and outside of Kevin Durant joining the Golden State Warriors, when has it worked when you're taking guys and putting stars together? Yeah. Again, I wait. <laughs> I wait. It, it, it's generally, it generally happens when you have – when you're bringing in – if, if you're bringing a star player into a situation where there are a bunch of really good role players, that works for me. You know, if you're bringing in um, a star player into a, another situation where there are two other star players, for me, that has not translated to winning. You know, when you bring Paul George and James Harden and, and Kawhi Leonard, that doesn't work. When you bring in Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and Bradley Beal, that doesn't work. You know, even if you want to add in a – bringing in a Damian Lillard to add with Chris Middleton and Giannis Antetokounmpo, that doesn't work. But I tell you what, when you bring in a Drew Holiday in Milwaukee, that works. You know, when you bring in a Drew Holiday and a Derek White in Boston, that works. For me, the big three model doesn't work in today's NBA. That's why I give Nico Harrison a ton of credit. For swinging for the fences in another way, because everybody wants to hit a home run, but it's okay to hit singles. P.J. Washington is a single. Derrick Jones Jr. is a single. Daniel Gafford is a single. All these guys are singles, and what eventually happens is you're sitting in the NBA Finals looking back at everybody else. So, yes, I love Paul George, the player. I love him as a player. I think he's incredibly skilled, um, incredibly talented. But I need to – I'm in wait-and-see mode with Joel Embiid, Paul George, and Therese Maxey because there are health questions around Joel Embiid. There are health questions that surround Paul George. So I'm still in wait-and-see mode. AD, we'll let you go with this. What is another move made this offseason that you've loved, disliked, or maybe mm. that you're still waiting on? i, I tell you the thing that, that um, I don't understand. Okay. Um, I don't understand why NBA teams bid against themselves. I struggle with that. Like to watch them, I, and for me, get your money. I, so I'm not getting mad at guys for getting their money. I just don't understand from the business aspect of it, overpaying certain guys that 29 other teams in the league wouldn't pay for that amount in the first place. Example, Patrick Williams in Chicago, right? They gave him five years, $90 million five years, $90 million, and he's a restricted free agent. Hmm. There was a point last year where Patrick Williams was coming off the, the bench for half the game. <laughs> so you can't tell me if he entered restriction, restriction uh, free agency that another team out there was going to give him $90 million. Hmm. So, like, I don't understand the concept of overpaying guys to keep guys there when the rest of the league doesn't value them in that particular way. When your serious XM deal runs out, our boss just texted us, how do we get AD in Dallas? So I just wanted to put that future, uh, we might be bidding against ourselves, yeah. but <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there because you are freaking electric, man. Thank you so much. Oh, for sure, guys. Anytime you need me, I'm here. Thanks wow. for having me. 